the best way to describe it is like a quarter life crisis. So I was like 25 ish and thinking, come on, what am I doing with my life? Like I've got this degree. I haven't really used it. I had a really well paying job at Norwich Union, but I was completely not interested in it at all. And I was partying and living up my twenties with lots of money to spend and no responsibility. But there was still that niggling thing of like, who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? Ha ha. Who am I and where am I going and what am I doing? You all have had this feeling, whether you are in employment, whether you are in business, this comes up regularly. And so it did for Laura. And you really need to listen to her story completely and find out where the journey has got her to because it's super interesting. And oh, by the way, for you businesses out there, small businesses out there, you will definitely want to hire Laura to do your on brand, let's call it photo shoot. She does some really amazing stuff. But before you get into that, listen to her story and check out what she did to make a difference to the business community that she's now involved in. Enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Laura. How are you today? Hello. Thank you very much for having me. And hello to all of your listeners. Brilliant. So you are in the north of the country, in the northeast. Yes, that's and right. And I don't think well, I can't count Richard Tubb, who very kindly introduced you to me uh, because he was in Birmingham when I interviewed him for my very first podcast. Really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh. And did you know this, this podcast is a milestone because it's my 50th. Oh, congratulations. Five zero. Oh. So wow. I'm honoured to have you on my 50th podcast absolutely brilliant yeah thank you very much <laughs> no no thank you for making the time i can't wait to hear your story <laughs> so as as we mentioned just before we got on this is very free flowing and but i do want you to start at the beginning so um our listeners would love to hear a little bit about your personal life and you know where you were born and then your education and <laughs> Have you moved around? And then we'll just flow from there. Is that okay oh, with you? Yeah, th those are my favourite podcasts. So I'm looking forward to share. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Thank you. Over to you, Laura. So um, in the 80s, I was born in London. Can you believe it? From the sound of wow. my voice. Um, my dad is a true Cockney from the East End of London and my mum is a Geordie and they got together at a house party in York in the 70s of some kind and then I was a product of the marriage in the early 80s in London. So I actually lived in London, I think I was about three when they decided to move north and have my little sister and we went to school and grew up here but technically I'm a South Londoner. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. So from the very get go, I suppose you could say I was traveling around a, a bit. Um, I went to I lived in a little village here in the northeast, a little pit village, which was just an idyllic childhood. You know, we were playing in trees and out all night until the rule back then was when the streetlights come, come on, it's time to come home. So, I, you know, I was out rough and tumble in fields, climbing trees, all of that stuff. Um, and then I think I got to about 12 or 13 and I was all ready to carry on and start my own life so I was thinking about this I was listening to your show with Steve and he was talking about um, always being a freelancer and I totally relate to that so I had my first job when I was 12 and I went home and I did a presentation to my mum and explained to her why it would be a great idea for her to get an Avon round in her name and I, I run the business so that was probably my first actual job was having my own business. Oh my God. Um, I know, isn't it crazy? What, what, hindsight is a beautiful thing. And mm. I've 
the penny's only dropped on that for maybe the last couple of years. But I would go into school and I'd wait until all the teacher, teachers were gathered in the staff room at lunchtime. I'd time it so that they'd all finish their lunch and they were in that like post-lunch slump. And then I'd go and knock on the staff room door and be like the Avon lady. And I had a good little racket running at school. And I had, I grew my round from one street to two streets. And I think the whole like cute, little girl fact I really helped because I I just had the cheek of the devil really when I look back on it and I had my regular clients I was always prospecting new ones um, and I just did that as like for fun because I wanted to earn some of my own money so as soon as I got to 16 I was ready to get more of a proper job and I remember applying to different supermarkets and things and I've always been a worker I've just always loved earning my own money it's something that I don't think we encourage enough in our children today through school um, but when I got to 18 I went off to university I was ready to kind of spread my wings a little bit and get away from the um, the hometown vibe so I went to do my first degree which was in marketing and public relations at the University of Lincoln and I have to say I really enjoyed it you know it was the formative years that you have when you go to university but by the time I got to my third year and did my dissertation I had explored a question around ethics like codes of ethics in business and how that actually affects moral ethics in public relations and after doing that dissertation I have to tell you I wasn't up for a career in public relations at all right <laughs> so I came home after graduating and made that announcement to my parents which they weren't very happy about given how much money and time we'd all spent on me getting that degree and I thought right well I don't know what to do now so I think I'll just go traveling I'll just do the backpacker thing and figure it out along the way yeah so Again, got another job, saved up, went off traveling and had a brilliant time. Really wild, crazy 20s backpacking time. It was marvelous. I went to um, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos and then got to Australia as part of a round the world trip. Landed in Australia, went to the first ATM machine I'd been to in about four months. And I had realized that all of my money was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't going to be going up to New Zealand in two weeks, as was the original plan. So I thought, right, it's fine. I'll just get a job. So I, I got had a couple of crazy jobs in Australia. At one point, I was uh, in a call center selling funeral cover to the dying people of Australia. Oh. Can you imagine? grim or what um I lasted about a month or so in that job before I just couldn't stand it any further mm -hmm. and then I talked my way into a job so there was this recruitment um office that you could go to in Sydney I don't know if it's still there or not and that was where all the backpackers went for work so you could get like your fruit picking jobs or office jobs or you know tradey jobs depending on what your skills were and I really liked the vibe in that office so I found out that they had a sister company, which was um, designed to help backpackers get their tax back. Mm -hmm. Now, when you are a backpacker in Australia, you still get taxed. And at the time, it was something crazy, like 33%. But if you can prove to the government that you're not actually a permanent resident, you can claim it back. So that's basically what this company was. And I, um, I managed to get myself a job there. And then over time, um, they found out that I had this marketing background. I, you know, I was a fresh graduate of these new hip and happening marketing ideas. And I managed to get myself sponsored. And that was it. I've made the decision, right? We're living in Australia. This is my life now. I'm now a Sydney cider. Like, that's it. Um, unfortunately, it was still the era of the dot-com boom. So this is like 2004, 2005-ish. And I was made redundant. So I had to come back home with my tail between my legs, really upset that I was no longer living in Sydney. So that was the first round the world trip. Um, I then lived in Norfolk for a period of time. My ex-boyfriend, he was from Norfolk, so we, we went and moved there. And I lived in a wild um, like actor, um, artist type of shared house in Norwich, which was a lot of fun. Um, and that's where I met Tom. Now, Tom is my current fiancé, and he had just finished a degree in photography. So finally, I'm now mentioning photography. <laughs> Okay, okay, now stop a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go into that, um, I want to track back a tiny little bit 
Okay. So not too far back, but let's talk about the backpacking. Yeah. You did this on your own completely? How old were you? I went with my ex-boyfriend. So he moved up. I think he had a row with his mum after we'd finished. We met at university and he moved up and lived with me and my mum and we saved and then we went backpacking together. Um, So that was the first adventure. But I have to say, what a shock to my Geordie sensibilities. Um, Two nights in Bangkok was I literally landed and I can still remember being so afraid of everything mm-hmm. so it you know putting yourself outside of your comfort zone it was just you know dropping yourself as a 22 year old girl in the middle of bangkok it freaked me the hell out and i remember we stayed in this really nice hotel so when you go to a place like sta travel they always recommend if you're going to a completely new city or a new part of the world get yourself in a decent hotel like at least for the first few days before you go into the hostel style and I remember being in this hotel thinking we've got to check out tomorrow and there's air conditioning here and there's nice clean water here in a fridge and I don't know if I'm going to cope with this and like looking at myself in the mirror and thinking right come on don't psych yourself out you can do this and then probably a week later I felt like I was completely acclimatized and you know I was a cast member from the beach or something but I I distinctively remember that being a key point in my traveling life where I ha- I was almost on the edge of thinking, no, I need to go home. <laughs> I can imagine. And and how long were you travelling for, all in all, including, you know, doing all the jobs and everything in Australia? Yeah, well, we, we lived in Australia for two years, and then the backpacker route bit was about four, four and a half months. So we really took our time. Um, I went all the way through rural um, Thailand on the train which was gorgeous from uh, Bangkok northwards and then we got into um, onto the Thai Lao border which is essentially just a rowing boat across a tiny little river which was fantastic Mm. and then um, worked my way down through Laos and then up um, through some real rural um, weird traveling to um, Hanoi and then down Vietnam and then across Cambodia so we did like a full kind of clockwise motion around Southeast Asia and then like I said yeah landed in Sydney to a serious shock on the old bank balance (laughs) and and so how were you able to okay four and a half months was the kind of backpacking but you were out there for two years yes and how did that work with your you know with the working visa or how how did that yeah, well, you usually have um, now you can get a two year visa on a working holiday visa in Australia, but that hadn't been invented when I was there. Right. It was, yeah, and then that's it, get out. But um, I managed to work for about eight months of my working holiday visa, yeah, and then I put, I got the company that I was working for to sponsor me on a business. Got you. Visa. And my boyfriend, he came in as my de facto. So I managed to get him to stay because he was, we could prove that we were living together in in like a, you know, a civil partnership, I suppose. Um, But then when my job, they realigned everything and they made me redundant, my visa fell through, which meant that his visa fell through as well. No, so like a domino effect. Exactly. Oh, and what's the plan at that stage to stay in Australia for yeah, that, a while? That was going to be it. That was going to be my life. I was going to. I loved it. I mean, Sydney is a really fun place to live, oh. and Australians have this wonderful positive attitude to life. It's different to the way that Americans see the world, which is also very positive compared to us Brits. But Aussies have like a no nonsense, stop whinging, embrace it, live it, love it kind of energy. And that was so much fun to be around. I I remember being really healthy. Like I I probably weighed a lot less than what I do now. But we I would go to work in my, you know, smart casual business outfit and I'd carry my bikini in my handbag and then get changed, put it on under my uniform at the end Stop of the day it. and go straight to the beach Stop after work. It. every night man that's how oh they my live. god that's yeah, just so place. ridiculous it's northeast of england now oh. <laughs> <laughs> laura what could have been oh don't don't even go there you'll have me in tears <laughs> So that was still um, the first trip. So I, there's more to follow. So um, okay, should okay. we go back to the point of Norwich now? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. 
So shoot forward and we're back in Norwich and um, my relationship wasn't going too well. I was having probably the best way to describe it is like a quarter life crisis. So I was like 25 ish and thinking, come on, what am I doing with my life? Like I've got this degree. I haven't really used it. I had a really well paying job at Norwich union, but I was completely not interested in it at all. And I was partying and living up my twenties with lots of money to spend and no responsibility. But there was still that niggling thing of like, who am I? Where am I going? What am I doing? So I met Tom And he had been doing a photography degree at Leeds Met and he had moved back to Norwich to um, to live with his stepmom and he was going traveling. Now, my relationship fizzled out. He was in a relationship as well that fizzled out because he was going traveling and we'd often get together and have beers and I'd be like, oh, you know, if you're if you're ever in Bangkok, you've got to do this and don't don't forget you've got to do that. And if you do this in Australia, it'll really help you. And after a while, we ended up getting together mm. and it time was ticking, you know, the, the ticket date was approaching and he was like, well, I'm going. And I thought, right, well, you know, it's, it's been fun while it lasted. And then before he went, he was like, why don't you just come out and meet me? I thought, no, come on, I've got to get serious. I need to decide what I'm doing with myself. But then I thought, yeah, go on then, let's do it. So he went off to um, Japan with a friend and then he did Western Australia on his own. And I actually moved in with his stepmom and got a a part-time job. So by day, I was this corporate auditor. And again, I was getting changed into a waitress outfit come five o'clock and then going to a Mexican restaurant and pulling in all the tips as a Mexican waitress. Oh my God. I, I managed to save a lot of money very quick doing that actually but it was that hustle you know that entrepreneurial sense of like right I need money quick let's just make this happen and I did it so I went off to Australia and I thought I'm going to have like a Shirley Valentine trip and do a little bit on my own just to prove to myself that I can do it so I did that and then I met Tom in Melbourne and we got a camper van and I finally got to do the original plan of what I wanted to in Australia you know three or four years previous and we drove right through Australia so we went right through the Red Centre and then down and up up the east coast and ended up in Cairns but because Tom is a photographer and he's a landscape guy he was all about you know planning the time for sunrise and he'd be saying mad things to me like right well we're up at four o'clock tomorrow morning because I need to get the sun there Mm. and I was like are you are you mad like this is crazy but over a few months he'd be like okay so pass me the wide angle lens pass me this I was helping him set up the tripod and I was really getting into it so By the time we got to um, New Zealand, I was like, yeah, this is really cool. And and I said, I I quite fancy this for myself, this photography game. It's really enjoyable. But I don't enjoy doing the landscape so much. I prefer the people side. So Tom was like, right, hand over that little digital compact thing that you're calling a camera. And we went into a secondhand shop in Wellington and I got an old Canon film um, 35mm camera. And for the rest of the journey, Tom would give me like little assignments, like see if you can find this or see if you can shoot in a certain way. So I, over time, I was kind of creating, I suppose, my first portfolio, really. Yes. Um, But then when we were in, like just before we left New Zealand, I noticed I was doing some research online and it was the UCAS deadline coming up to apply. And I thought, I'm going to do a course in this. So I applied to Newcastle College Art School in an internet cafe in New Zealand. And it was like five minutes till the deadline. And I just, you know, the personal statement that everyone goes on about with kids. I just, I trolleyed something off quickly in five minutes and thought, yeah, that'll do. So by the time we got back, we we went to Fiji and then we went to America. But by the time we got back, I had this interview set up um, at Newcastle College. And because of the way that Tom had had me shooting things to help me learn by doing, I had this body of work to take along with me. Um, And I remember sitting in the in the room having a conversation with one of the most inspirational lecturers I've ever had. And she said she was like, you've never even you haven't even got art GCSE, Laura, but this is an outstanding body of work. And I want to give you an unconditional offer on the course. Wow. 
I got in. So I was like the the grandma of the class because I was, you know, my late 20s and everyone else was like 18 and 19. And it was still a real novelty for them to go out clubbing and things. But I was I absolutely loved that course, man. It was so much fun. I'd be in the library pouring over, you know, 1960s Vogues. And I did so much extra research just purely for the love of it. And finally, I felt like I had found what it was that I was supposed to be doing. Finally, it clicked. So I had real, probably the majority of my 20s was me figuring out, right, who am I and where am I going? And then finally, it made sense. So I hustled hard when I was a student to make sure that I could get as many um, photography assistant placements as possible. And I set a little goal for myself where I was going to be an assistant for every different type of photographer I could. So I remember doing a placement with a product photographer and I found that so boring because it's very quiet, Mm. meticulous, calculated work. And that is not my style. And then I did work with um, a fashion photographer, couple of different fashion guys and I enjoyed that but again it just didn't feel right and then I worked with a few um, events photographers but by the end of my degree I already had myself a job offer which is very rare when you come out of a photography degree Uh, but because I had already been building my CV as an assistant someone was ready to just give me a job as soon as I had graduated and I got myself a great assistant job um, down in Hartlepool which is quite a commute from where I live at a portraiture studio and I really enjoyed that because I could see how this lady was running the marketing and the branding side of her business and kind of learn the business side of it but then also develop my photographic skills and you kind of as a photographer when you're working with people you need that other skill which is how you relate to people and how you get the best out of people and learning from her was fantastic for that so I had to learn all sorts of crazy things like how old is a baby before they can lift their head and how old before they can sit up and what you need to do if a child just randomly has a tantrum how you get them to calm down quickly and get the best out of a family dynamic you know all of those things that aren't really to do with photography you know you know the technical of how you should set your camera but that people side was so important and Then I got poached. So I was poached by a couple of guys who were setting up their own studio. They were X Venture. So I think most people are familiar with the Venture model. It's like that um, high priced, uh, hard sales portraiture studio. And they wanted me to come straight in as um, the senior photographer in in their studio. And they were in Newcastle. So I moved away from the Hartlepool studio which was like a nice family vibe and into this job and my goodness it was a nightmare so they were hard selling people I had to learn how to hard sell people which brought me back to my days of selling funeral cover in Australia um And I really didn't enjoy it. And I started noticing fairly quickly that their partnership was on the rocks. They ended up dividing their partnership and one guy left. So it was me and this other chap. Mm. And he was running the business into the ground. So he had debts with the printers. He had debts with the rent. And then he was trying to hard sell new clients to get their money, but to pay for overhead, not product. So then People were ringing up and complaining because they hadn't had their orders in. It was just a royal mess. Mm -hmm. So I so much there because I knew all of the things not to do compared to the previous job where it was such a lovely family feel and everything was run ship shape. But I got to breaking point with that job just before Christmas. So in the portraiture game, it's very heavy at Christmas time. You know, people buy portraits for grandma you know it's a great time to do your annual photo shoot as a family but it is a really busy time and I remember one day I must have had about four back-to-back complaint calls people were furious and worrying about getting things in time for Christmas and the guy that I work for rang up and said um hey Laura I won't be in today it's my birthday so I'm having the day off And I lost my temper. I just thought, right, screw this. He owed me like two months wages. And I thought, that's it. I'm done. And I just left. I just walked out there and left. And I remember we had quite a grim Christmas that year because we, I didn't have any money. And I thought, right, I now I've seen it. Like I know how to do the marketing thing. 
I've learned, I've earned my stripes with a lot of different photographers. I've seen from the portraiture game what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Now is the time for me to do this myself. So I set about, you know, the new year rolled around and I set about, I wrote a business plan. I got myself some funding and I went into the portraiture business as a photographer because that was what I had learned directly. Yes. Um I did that. I, I had a great little studio in the middle of Newcastle, um, but it's there was still something that just didn't feel right. So I really didn't enjoy doing the weddings very much, but I did them because it was good money. And, I, you know, I liked the family stuff, but I didn't like the old fashioned portrait or model where everything relies on the final cell. So you kill yourself doing all of the work and creating all the beautiful slideshows. And then it all rests on that final cell. And if you don't make a sale for whatever reason, all that work is, you know, you might, it's pointless. You, you killed yourself for nothing. Mm. So I, I, over time, I, I ditched the weddings first, and then I ditched the family stuff. Then after a while, I ditched the baby stuff, and I started honing it down. And during that same time, I was having so much fun photographing headshots, which wasn't really a common thing then. So people would kind of swing by the, the studio and say, hey, you know, I need a good shot with some good lighting. And I'd say, yeah, right, 50 quid? We'll just do 50 quid? No problem. Bish, bash, bosh. There's three files see you later. But then a penny dropped and I thought, hang on a minute. I know a fair few things about marketing. And what if you bring out the brand in the photograph and you pay a bit more attention to how it fits with the client's website and with their brand colors and what it is they're trying to say as an entrepreneur. And then that was basically where my business was born from. So I ended up getting rid of my studio and I thought, right, I, I love working with business people. You know, I love networking. The people thing is definitely still there from my years in portraiture, but let's throw in this other element and do a little bit of social media, make the photo shoot an event for the client and fit it in with their current marketing plan. So I think that's what makes me unique. I mean, I've, I've been a hell of an adventure, but that's what I now do. I am a headshots photographer, but we have a lot more um, planning consultancy in the run up to it. And we, we make the photo shoot the event and that really has great return on investment for my clients. So I still try and feed the travel bug and I of, I'm often all over the world shooting and I love that part. And I, you know, those that being scared in Bangkok thing and knowing how to pack a case so that your shampoo doesn't leak everywhere and all the like visa things and all that stuff. It was all really looking back in hindsight again, it was all a great crash course of how to do what it is that I do today. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. And the the thing is what I love about the journey. And you know, whenever I listen to people's stories, when mm. you listen to the life experiences they have along the way, Yes. You know, they are no accidents, right? This it, is Yeah, it's total kismet, isn't it? It's total preparation. It's all yeah. all of it that you've described in terms of what you experienced. You know, even to the point about what you mentioned about that job with those two entrepreneurs that was really salesy. And yeah. even even if you were there for five minutes and learned some of those skills you know, in how to talk to people, how to upsell stuff or whatever, is still not wasted time. Um, exactly. Yeah. Even working for somebody that was, you know, not a very good boss in the end and, you know, he, he just decided not to come in and you had to hold the fort and everything and, and walking out, you know, that's a gift as well. It was a push. It was a push yeah. for you to go out and do it on your own. And yeah, if you think you can do better, just get on and do it. Yeah, for sure. And the challenges, even the challenges with the travel and being abroad and landing in Bangkok and going, oh, my God, what have I done? <laughs> You're still alive to tell the tale. Yeah. And you know what? I go to Bangkok on my own tomorrow now. That's yes. how I feel about it. But I know 
I only know that because I know I can do it. Like, we don't realize how capable and, you know, how much you can do something until you really put yourself out of your comfort zone. And I think even the idea of going outside of the comfort zone for some people, it's just too much. It's too scary to even contemplate. But when you do it and when you're in it and you're living it, you realize so quickly that, oh, of course I can do this. Of course I can. Yeah, and we're so resilient at the end of the day. We don't give yeah. ourselves enough credit. And, you know, your story is a massive lesson in, in resilience. It's a massive lesson in, you know, going with the punches. I mean, that's that's what um, being in business is all about, right? Oh, um, every day. Yes, every day. You've got to be able to think on your feet. You know, I don't think we realize just how many decisions, and some of them are really important decisions, that we make as entrepreneurs. And you're doing it all of the time. And when you're not doing it, you're making, you know, you're preempting the new decisions that might be cropping up at the end of the week. <laughs> I know. And decisions are really important. Though. In fact, there is, um, there's a um, podcast, uh, episode 42, and whilst we're talking about decisions, I'm going to mention it. It's a, it's a guy called Harun Rabani, and I actually, um, well, it's episode 42 is his story, but I, I recorded another episode with him, episode 44, where he talks about the art of decision making. Oh, and I love it. He he made some, he makes some really great distinctions on that because we don't realize, as you've just said, all the decisions that we're making all of the time. And in fact, what he recommended was at the end of the day, think back over the day and see if you can work out some of the important decisions you made and then journal about it. Because when you journal oh, about those decisions, you actually get better at making better decisions believe it or not. And so, yeah, you're right. Decision making is totally huge in, in whatever we do. So in the, I'd like to kind of delve a little bit deeper in, because I'm super fascinated in, because yeah. I looked at some of your work. Okay. And I'd like to, I call myself a storyteller. And yes. I'm not really, because I haven't written any books. I don't tell any stories. But the work that I do through whiteboard animation, I tell stories that way. And yeah. what I've noticed in your work, and looking some of your photography that you've put everywhere, you definitely, even with your portrait shots of people, are creating a story around them. Yeah, so I, I the, the telling of a story, I love it. I love it if, if it's just you and me chatting over a cocktail or what I love the most about photographic storytelling is that you can't use any words. You have to put it in the picture. So I, I'm often saying to new clients, right, every picture says a thousand words. Let's pick what those 1,000 words are. You know, if you're in front of a plain white backdrop, what does that actually say by not saying anything? So let's think very carefully about what we're telling people. And another thing is I, I danced as a child. So I had, you know, we were, we were dancing girls, me and my sister. And I think that the art of choreography, you know, it, that tells a story. So you're telling a story, but without using words, it's one of those really cool challenges to have, especially when you're a chatterbox like me. <laughs> yes. So, so that, that, that's the, the, the quest that I'm always on, I think, with every client. So how do you go about getting the right story out of them and then how to capture that? Yeah, well, th this is interesting. So you have some clients who are already pretty brand savvy. Maybe they've worked with a great graphic designer or a specific brand consultant. And I actually love it when new clients come to me and they already have, um, you know, like the brand guideline document that's been created, but that's usually very graphic orientated. So you'll see their logo in different iterations. You'll have their hex code colors on there. Um, and maybe they have an overall mission 
statement or they have a few key brand values and that's how they want to present themselves through their business. Right now, we're seeing a huge surge in the art, I think, of the personal brand. So you have all of those things in place, but you have a lot more personality. So you are the core of those values and it it reflects on your personality and how you do business. But more importantly, why you're there in the first place because everyone does have a story. This is the joy of this podcast. Mm. Why gotten to one career there's a reason why in your past and it's about pulling that out so usually it all starts with me either looking over the existing um, brand assets that someone has and if they don't have them that's fine too usually it's just a, a long conversation where I end up doing a lot of mad scribbling in a notepad where I'm getting a sense of who they are from the things that they're saying and that they're presenting to me, but I'm also getting a feeling like an intuitive feeling of what they're like as a person. And I'll make notes on all of those things and then kind of come back to them and say, right, you strike me as somebody who is pretty out there and confident, or you strike me as someone who's an introvert, but it works well for your business in this way. And I I work on the personality stuff with the brand stuff in mind. And then it, it differs. So some people might have, they might be old hats when it comes to headshots and they know that they're doing a specific launch of something. Let's say it's a book or an online course. And they know that those headshots that they want to shoot with me directly relate to that one specific call to action. That's usually like my top tier clients because they're getting headshots all year long. The more, um, the more popular amount of clients that I have is they want an official headshot to represent their business. And when we do uh, different lengths of photo shoots, we we create different quantities of pictures. So we could really go into it and tell a real story around their business. And that's when I get my stylists on board, my hair people, my makeup people, sometimes my special effects people. And we all work together to create those mini stories within the brand. But we will shoot that either over half a day or over a whole day. And we will create some official shots that that client can then go and use for a multitude of different purposes for their brand to promote their business. Usually with with the view to thinking we'll pick this up again in maybe two years time and maybe refresh them, see where your business is, see where your marketing plan is and see if we can do something that's still in line with those original shots, but maybe a little bit more focused on where you're going. I mean, we know how quickly your business changes in two years. If I think where I was was two years ago or where I want to be in two years time it looks very different to where I am right now yeah so we have that and then we have a paired back version where it's a lot quicker maybe people just have like a shockingly bad sunburnt selfie of them holding a Del Boy cocktail (laughs) and that's what they're looking as their LinkedIn photo and they just need to get this a little bit more professional and they need to do it quickly we have those services as well where we do a very quick Um, version of the consultancy and the planning there's not usually the extra team that we have but we meet up and we get some great shots and I love it when I meet those types of clients because they're usually nearer the beginning of their journey in business so that maybe they're not 100% sure of how they want their brand to grow they just know that they need to make a start and you know make that stand and get some great photos that match where they are and they learn a lot from me by osmosis I think so that when it comes to that two year mark or sometimes they get in touch with me quicker they're ready to go a step further got you okay wow it's it sounds fascinating because i think this is where people don't often know what's behind it all you see a photograph and you go yeah that's really great i mean as when i was browsing on your website i found richard tubbs oh yeah in front of all the comic strip kind of on the walls and on a door and because of course we know I know how much he loves comics and uh, so it's to see that photograph of him is just absolutely spot on yeah Um, 
essentially Richard, isn't it? But prior to that, he was running in the mainstream, like visual vein. Not, I mean, he's a, a wonderful content creator and he's quite an influencer in IT as well. Yes. But he was thinking that he had to stick to the rules. So most IT headshots will be a man or a woman in a grey blazer with, you know, if they, they've probably paid money and it's a good quality shot, it's in focus and everything and well lit, but it's great. It says nothing about that person. And Richard is one of the great examples for a personal brand. You know, you get to know Richard and like you've just said, within probably half an hour of talking, you'll discover that he's a huge comic fan. Mm. So I was like, let's bring that visual thing into your shots. And it's a an homage to the true you. And people are diehard fans of him and they know that as well so it's it's almost it gets to the point where it becomes like an in joke but all, not only that it makes him stand out massively from the rest of the it world because you think it's a whole sea of gray and then this vibrant colorful comic book related guy who's he what's he about yeah absolutely <laughs> because I mean, in effect, it makes people more curious, doesn't it? And yeah. they want to learn more about that individual and get, get close. Well, I think what it does, it builds intimacy. That's what yeah. it does. It allows people to, to see a bit of the story behind the person and therefore you, you have more affinity and, um, Actually, the word is relatable, but you become more relatable to the individual and yes. therefore you relate to them. You may even see something you've got in common and therefore go, actually, I now know what that person's about. We have something in common. And when you find the common thread, you already feel like you know them. Yeah, and it makes you. It it helps to um dis in the buying process to go back to like a technical marketing term. It would instantly disqualify people, as well as qualify them. So you're you're making yourself a little bit more divisive. And let's face it, the people that you have to work really really hard to sell to, or you know, keep a business relationship going because you're just chalk and cheese. Why do that to yourself when you know you can create a whole posse of diehard fans who just get you and get your style? Those are the people that I prefer to work with. And I'm sure there's entrepreneurs listening to this right now who agree. <laughs> and and do you just work in the Northeast or do you work across the country? I work all over the world. So I got to the point where my my travel senses were tingling, I suppose, and I wanted to do more overseas so the northeast is a lovely business community but it's quite small and i love um the national so the the british entrepreneurial scene is really exciting and quite vibrant right now but i wanted to take it further so i've started to do um well, probably a couple of years ago actually i've i started working around big conferences so my reason for this was I thought, right, what, what would Annie Leibovitz do or what did she do in her career? And she was around in the 60s. She got herself shooting the Rolling Stones and it was of the time. It was the zeitgeist. That's what she was shooting. Now, right now, I firmly believe that we are in the midst of a digital renaissance. We are making friends with people all over the world in, you know, in a quick DM. It's possible. And it is a whole renaissance. I think we're seeing such a wonderful surge in musicians and artists. All the creative people around the world are working in this new plane. So I thought, right, I want to photograph that. I want to be an old lady and say I was of that time. That's what I shot. And I really think that we're seeing this upswing now with entrepreneurs Entrepreneurs, people are getting made redundant. People work from home much more now. And that's a thing that I, I want to capture. I want to see it. So I thought, how can I meet these people? Like, I can't just DM someone in San Francisco and say, hey, do you want to shoot? And by the way, can you pay for my flight? Because yes. no one's going to say yes to that. <laughs> so I've started um, going to 
business related and specifically social media related conferences around the world to see if I can find people who are into it and it's working it's taken it's taken a couple of years and a lot of hard work doing research on the delegates that go to these events but being in it and amongst it and throwing myself into the deep end that way has resulted in some fantastic international business and I love it because I get to do the traveling thing as well. Wow, well done. That's 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 amazing. <laughs> Again, what, a, what a great you know what it goes back to that comfort zone thing because I remember preparing for the first time I went to social media marketing world and you know the the price for the conference ticket and then the price for the flights and you know travel insurance and all of those things and oh god do I need a new lens you're looking down you know the barrel of a very expensive gun there and thinking I can't do this and you know I straight away I was back there in Bangkok thinking I can't do this I was like no damn it I can and I managed to get enough job on that first year to make it into a profitable trip just by connecting with people online. Yeah. So it is completely possible to do. It's really interesting. What about the startup community then? So business startup, maybe tech startups, have you got involved with them? I went to, um, I was shooting at Newcastle Startup Week uh, in May, and there's a lot of tech stuff going on in Newcastle there's like the whole science city thing and lots of people developing apps and things and that is a, an untapped area for me I'm, I met some really interesting people um the whole bitcoin thing I don't really understand it but it is an interesting world um but it, it is happening right it's of the time so I feel yeah that's a prerequisite for me before I want to get involved and work with people why not? So maybe maybe tech events is where I need to go. If I tell you what, if any listeners know of any cool tech events coming up for the rest of this year, DM me and let me know. <laughs> well, the, the reason I mention it is that Birmingham has a thriving tech community mm. and um, there are regular events taking place at something called Innovation Birmingham and the iCentrum and there's like... Uh, I don't know, 160 startup companies in one location in Birmingham. But there seems to be a lot going on and a, a lot around digital leaders. And I think there was a couple of weeks, or oh, maybe four weeks ago or so, there was like a digital leaders uh, week where all around the country there were events being taken place for, they called it Digi Leaders. And... Um, I know we're going a little bit off topic, but I, mm. I I thought of you because one thing that I've noticed about these startups, they um, are just not very good at storytelling. Yes. And well, it's scary at that stage, isn't it? Yeah. Like when when you're, you're you're going out, you're taking off the um, the hat of employee usually, or sometimes a lot of people these days are keeping it on because it's the side hustle that they're doing, and they want to keep their hand in a part time job for the regular income, but then at the same time present themselves to the world as this founder or CEO, and that is a hard thing to do it is really hard because it's so alien to us to put yourself out there and you know you, you get into it after a year or so and you when you think all right yeah I've got this people trust me when they when I tell them that I am this but that first bit is tough so yeah I could definitely say maybe we should um, go and hit one of these tech events you and I and you can do the the story behind and I'll do the pictures well I know one startup in London this one is not a tech event and I know, and I mean, I know several startups in in Birmingham, and um, it'd definitely be an idea to connect with those people. Or what the best thing for me to do, and I'm I'm sorry to the listeners, but we're this is how sometimes business works, right? <laughs> in, in having a casual conversation and coming up with ideas to help each other, uh, it's an important point actually. But it is, yeah. once we've published this podcast, I can forward this podcast on to those people and go. Listen to Laura, you need to check her out and perhaps set up an appointment for what she can do for your business and for your startup yeah. because I think you could definitely help some of those people for sure. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like fun. Yeah, I, I love anything like that. And this is what it's like, you know, it, it's the same as being a backpacker. So if 
if you're on a train somewhere and you see some other backpackers and they go, hey, have you checked this place out? When you get there, tell them that we sent you when you can get a discount or whatever, or this is how it works when you're doing diving there. It's the same now in business, exactly what you've just said. <laughs> I like that analogy a lot. I, yeah. I do like that a lot. I mean... You know, um, that was how, you know, the Lonely Planet Guides? Yes. That was how how they started so it would be a bunch of hippies i don't know in the 60s or something and they would have written out pamphlets on where they've just been and where you can go and where you can go and maybe get a free meal and then if they saw when they were leaving they would hand the guide like a written out notes to the next person and that was the beginning of lonely planet eventually a very clever entrepreneur whose name i should know thought hang on a minute this is a collection of work let's pr- like Pu- properly publish this mm. but that's how it started it's it, the power of word of mouth never fails to amaze me mm. yeah very very good point laura I, I, we're, we're probably coming towards the end of our chat but i i know there is a lot more going to happen in your journey it sounds amazing well done for everything you've achieved so far if people want to get in touch with you and follow your work how can they do that? So, you know, let us know where they can find you online. Okay, so I'm quite a social butterfly. And given that I do a lot of um, research in social media, I'm on all of the platforms. I don't, I'm not on um, Snapchat anymore. It just got too much for me. So you can find me on Pinterest, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And all you need to look for on any of those platforms is L Pearman Photos. That's my hanger on everything. So wherever you feel more comfortable online, you contact me and I'll I'll work around you. That's how I like to do it on social. Brilliant. And your website, what's that called? Is laurapearman.com and you spell Pearman like the fruit with a man on the end. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very interesting name as well. <laughs> I say that about 50 times a day, you know. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine. It's always, yeah, when we've got strange surnames that we have to explain to people how to spell it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, fabulous. I, I loved our chat. Thank you very much. And I'm going to try and get you hooked up to some of these startups. If I can get you to Birmingham, then we'll probably meet up for lunch or something. Oh, um, yeah, let's for sure and meet you in person thank you for your time laura have thank a great so rest of your day and we'll see each other soon yeah see you soon thank you take care bye for now bye staying alive uk share your story 